Hi, my name is John Westhoff. I'm the writer, publisher, letterer for Part-Time Comics, and I'm here to talk about our new project, Drumsticks of Doom, which you can find at linktree.com forward slash part-time comics with an X, and you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented uh, publisher and comic writer and a variety of other things that he does in comics with his own amazing work here. Uh, this is the first time I've seen his work, and I, I love what I'm seeing so far, even though it's one story of many that I'm sure he's told Currently, he has a Kickstarter coming out pretty soon. We'll let him talk about that. We're joined today by John Westhoff. How are you doing today, John? Hey, Kurt. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Nice. So the one thing I didn't mention, of course, is the actual comic. So shame on me for that. But for those that don't know anything about Drumsticks of Doom and yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and tell us what Drumsticks of Doom is all about. Well, thanks again for having me on to talk about it. Uh, and don't feel bad. Lots of people won't know about Drumsticks of Doom, even though I feel like I've been badgering people over the head with it for about three months since we started promoting. But it is a new project. It is up for pre-launch and will launch February 9th, if people are listening to this after, on Kickstarter. Uh, there's a lot of description on there, but let me give you the short pitch. Black Sabbath, not the Beatles, became the most popular band in the world, and thus the universe was changed forever. Uh, heavy metal became the most popular music on the planet, uh, unlike other uh, popular music today. Our main character, Lana, she just wants to make her own music. She just wants to make her indie music and she doesn't really fit in. She's been in metal bands, you know, all her young life. You know, she wants to make the transition, but she doesn't know how and doesn't know if she'll be successful. And that's kind of where our story picks up. I mean, also toss in a bit of the the wild world of the the occult of the fantastical of the everything else along that line which i wasn't expecting by the way you know you have an amazing story i i love well, well from what i've read i i love it i love the fact that there's great action there's great chemistry at least with the initial characters that i've i've gotten to read so far and and awesome. i think it's going to be an amazingly fun book so looking at this comic and and this world that you've built why was it important to make this world for drumsticks of doom well i came up with the idea like uh, a lot of ideas i come up with it's kind of a uh, an inside joke or, or something you know it's kind of a one-off thought and then once you really sit and stew on it you're like well maybe i have a bigger story here so the the title drumsticks of doom is is a play on a uh, a song by the band man of war i don't know if people are familiar mm -hmm. uh worldwide popular uh, 80s 90s power metal english band uh so drumsticks of doom they have a song called drums of doom so I just kind of thought of this world, you know, thinking of it as like a man of war inspired world. It felt a little bit too much like the show Metalocalypse, which I also mm -hmm. loved it. Uh, so about six, seven years ago, you know, I came up with this, this idea and didn't really know what's the in in that story rather than just remaking Chuck Beebe's death metal or, you know, Metalocalypse all over again. And it took me a while to get to the story. And it was really the artist of Drumsticks of Doom, Dan Doherty. Uh, we did a project, a music themed anthology called Banthology through my previous publisher that I worked with, uh, Kingbone Press, for, for about 10 years. And we did three volumes of that. And I had never met Dan before. I was introduced through friends. And he did this amazing story called The Beast in Me, which was about music. When you create music and you always kind of have that drive to want to be successful. And if you don't really get there, you know, how do you, how do you cope with that? It was just such an amazing story. I mean, if you've seen the art, Kurt, I mean, his art alone is enough but the fact that he had this kind of background in, in music it really planted a seed in me like i want to tell stories with music but how do you do that in comics and it did really take me several years to really find you know where the character was and this is really about again a young woman who she doesn't know if she wants to be in bands anymore and she doesn't know what she wants to do in her young adult life and something that i went through i played in bands for about you know 15 years pretty much since i was like 14 years old i've, I've always been in a band never really had a ton of success but it still was really part of my character, I felt like, and how I, I, I made friends and, and relationships. And, and, and so, so much of it revolved around that. And even though I don't now, I felt like, how can I add that into a story? Somebody kind of going through that transformation and do they want to continue with music? But I also understand that I'm not Jaime Hernandez and I'm not, 
I, I don't know if I can tell such a grounded story and have people really. So I was like, well, let's throw some wolves in there and some occult stuff. And what, how did that happen? And, and that was kind of how it came to be. <laughs> well, I, I love taking two passions, obviously comic creation. And of course, you know, music, which is a wonderful, wonderful combination, which like you have mentioned has been done in the past, but uh, you know, I don't, I think it's a genre that not many people really have done frequently or recently when it comes to, their own passions because they're so focused on what's what's in the now what's in the the current either sci-fi or superheroes or whatever it is so so you're taking a an underused genre and you're making it into you know a fun story that looks amazing the artwork yeah you're right the Doherty's artwork is just beautiful i love the simplistic black and white i love the fact that there's some amazing darks and shadows and and the action itself the, the motion of characters and everything like that is just really well done i just i love it well thank you so much yeah he, he you know it was a, it was i was very fortunate that he had the time in his schedule to do it he and i have, again have known each other for a few years through making other comics but you know you never know um uh, and, and I had some other artists in mind, you know, that have musical background, but I really felt like Dan was a good fit and it was really glad he, he was interested. I, I, we actually tried to pitch it around to some publisher, you know, how that goes. And, yeah. and we've actually been working on it for about 18 months together. It's been about two years since I pitched it to him and he started it, you know, in the, in the awesome time of uh, 2020. So <laughs> we're coming up on two years. I was like, you know what, Dan, we just need to go to Kickstarter. Let's get this out in the world. We've been sitting on it too long. So. That's how we how we got here. Obviously, this wasn't a pandemic type project, but it, the pandemic helped make make it come to fruition. Obviously, uh, from what it sounds like. So, from a creative standpoint, I, I guess it's the pandemic has helped you. Yeah, I mean, like most people, it's had its ups and its downs. We've had some success. I stepped away from Kingbone Press in 2018. You know, I took a year off, and in 2019, I was like, you know, I really I do want to at least publish some of my own stories and have like a place to house them. So I started planting those seeds. And then of course I picked 2020 to launch it, which was not great, but, but honestly, we, we've had other books. Like, you know, our first book was um, child possession services, which we released early last year. We had a, a magic, the gathering themed anthology called on the stack. We had some success. So I, I do think, I don't want to say it's helped because uh, I, I know that would be uh, disingenuous, but it's certainly the pandemic has a lot of us kind of focusing on, you know what, what do we really want to do with our lives? What, what's something that's really, you know, burning inside us that we really now is the time to, to, to put that together. And I think that's why you, you probably know you, you've interviewed, you know, Chuck Satterley and some other amazing creators. I see a ton of projects coming out in like the last half of last year, it was like everyone's passion project was coming to late, which is good. You'd love to see it, but then it's, it's also like, Oh wow. You know, we're all kind of uh, coming out at the same time. So. <laughs> well, I, I I think being creative, you have to have some some goal, some focal point when it comes to putting together what you want to create. And and while yeah, pandemic isn't the best uh, solution when it comes to um, creativity, it at least gives you a sense of purpose in 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 a, in a time that is not full of purpose which is time full of chaos to be perfectly yeah. honest and so you know people turn to the arts people turn to projects like like drumsticks of doom and, and part-time comics that you've you've created a, a great house of amazing comics from what i've seen as well too so you know we we all deal with situations like this in our own in our own way and i'm glad that people like yourself are are doing um a positive uh, take on it yeah, a lot of us, we're out here trying, you know, pride people with entertainment. Like you said, it's it's also about yourself and, and you know, setting those goals and, and working through these creative projects can really help you in challenging times. So, you know, if anybody's sitting on ideas, you know, I do encourage you. Comics are not easy to make, but it, it is a medium where, um, you know, you, you can see it come to light. And I enjoy that part of comics. You're probably not going to make your own TV show or, or movie. You know, most of us aren't going to do that. Novels, maybe, but comics, you can kind of sit down with an idea you know, even if it's a 12 page, you know, story, it's just really enjoyable. And you're right. And these times, uh, you, you know, we need those, those things that kind of lift us up. As a comic book writer, how long have you been uh, writing for comics? Um, a, a little over a decade. I think I started in 2009. I was on a comic book message board, a uh, great message board, you know, now he's old saying stuff like that. <laughs> Call it the 11 o'clock comics message board, the amazing podcast. 
and met a lot of cool people on there. And I never really had a desire to write. I wasn't one of those kids who was like, you know, I'm, I want to make comics someday. Uh, I, I always like to create like, you know, comedy videos with my friends and, and do creative things like that. And obviously, again, I was in a band. Uh, and then again, as that kind of was winding down or, or I was feeling like that wasn't really going to be my main creative outlet. Um, I said, you know what, let me give it, I have a couple ideas. Let, let me see how this would go. And thankfully, you know, my longtime partner at Kimbo and Press, Bob Garnellis, he responded and he said, yeah, I'll draw your, your silly story. And we worked together for, for, we still, now we make comics together. So uh, that was kind of how it started for me. So in your opinion, then what is the most important quality of a, of a writer in comics today? Well, I really feel like you have to be kind of a project manager. I think to be to be a writer, I think you have to understand and be able to adapt to what's going on, especially now. You know, artists get busy, colorists get other work, people get sick, people have family issues. So you have to be able to adjust. I mean, early on when I started writing comics, you know, Bob taught me how to letter my own comics. That was a skill that I kind of picked up and I've been able to utilize. I still letter my own comics to this day. I'm learning how to color flat. You know, I've learned how to design. I do my own, most of my own uh, credits pages. Be flexible, be, be willing to learn. You're not just going to sit down in comics and write a script and hand it off to somebody and it's going to come out and be published and sent to stores. You, you have to be ready to wear the multiple hats. If your desire is to be a writer first, that's great. Uh, but in independent comics specifically, it will save you a lot of time, energy, frustration, and, you know, resources like money if you... Uh, are willing to to do different things and, and do all that encompasses, you know, getting a book together and ready for print. So then how did these skills translate to the comics you've created today? Well, I hope that I've, uh, you know, we kind of joked tongue in cheek before we started that, you know, one of my titles is letterer. I do letter my own things. Some of that is is to save money, but I also, I enjoy that part of it. I feel like I'm contributing. I'm getting to know, you know, the art and the character and the process better. I can also change my dialogue on the fly. Uh, which, you know, it can be a cumbersome process if you're, you know, handing it back and forth to a letter or asking them to do extra work. I've always kind of enjoyed the process of it. It gives me time to really say, well, did I have this down right? And now that I'm seeing the art with the letters, does this really fit? Or is there too much dialogue? I can just take it out. Is there, does there need to be more explained? I can add it in. Uh, so I think it's really, to me, it really helps my stories. If I handed off that first or second draft and didn't really have that time afterwards, I think a lot of my stories would would miss key points or things would be missing. Um, so I've enjoyed it. The flatting is, is similar. I am very slow at it. But again, I think it gives me more time with the pages, uh, more time to think about the character. And that's the part of it I enjoy. So when I feel like I put out product, I'm doing my bulk of the work, you know, to get it out. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Well, I am a social worker by day. <laughs> so I definitely, uh, that is part of my desire to write is Working with human beings, I think you you come across emotional moments and like you said, language is power. What you communicate into the world is important. How you put it out, being mindful of that, not just your verbal language, but your body language, your, your physical, how you uh, relate to people in that way is important. So I do try to put that in my comics. And that was something I learned very early on in a lot of the work that I do. You know, of course, you don't go into this, this field with the intent of helping yourself, but I do feel like working in, with human beings, it does really help you pick up on a lot of those aspects that, that are important and impactful. And again, when you, I sit down to write entertainment, like you said, some of the stuff is fantastical and silly and over the top. And, and you know, there's alchemy and other stuff. And in my stories, I think at, at their core, I try to relate, you know, a human story in there. The themes are always important as well, too, when it comes to creation and, and telling a wonderful story. What themes spoke to you as you were writing this drumstick of doom comic you know i think the theme of transition and maybe it's just where i'm at in my life uh, you know just just turning 40 and feeling like um, i have goals maybe i didn't accomplish or goals that i want to see so i think that that theme is is going to be pretty heavy in this even though the character the main character is younger uh, my hope is that if the kickstarter is as, as successful as we want it to be we can tell more stories and it will really be about you know a transition through her life and how she copes with are you where you're at where you want to be in your career as my day job, you know, maybe I sat down at 15 when I kind of had the idea that I wanted to help human beings and now sitting down at 40, has it played out? Has there things that I've missed? Is, is there things that I regret? Hopefully we can get there with this character, you know, 
over, you know, nine or 12 issues of a uh, story. The nameology aspect, I always find it interesting when it comes to talking to the various creators I've, I've talked to over the past 13 years. Now, how did you come up with the names of these characters? And and actually, who are some of the characters? Well, our main character is Lana. Uh, you know, it's funny you ask. I don't know if anybody's ever asked me this before. I have a uh, an inside joke within my family. All of my long-term relationships with people with L's in their names. So when I usually, when I sit down to write a character, I, I think, you know, what's the first um, L name that comes to mind? You know, it's kind of an inside joke to myself that usually the woman character has an L in her name, typically in most of them, unless, unless the other creator has an idea, which happened before. And then of course, you know, that's better for the story. This character, we haven't revealed her last name, but her last name is, you know, it is a reference to you know, heavy metal and rock lore. So once that's revealed, uh, you know, we'll come back and talk about that. As far as the other characters, again, her sidekick, the one who plays in, in her indie rock band on the side in secret. His name is Jimmy. That's another inside joke. I have a lot of my close friends are named Jim or James. So I try to add, you know, a Jim or James into a lot of the stories, which uh, is to the much to the groans of my friends who read my, you know, read my stuff and proofread it. They're like, another Jim. It's like, it's an ongoing thing. <laughs> what was the hardest scene for you to write in this book? The hardest scene, and it will be previewed on the Kickstarter. I am a musician, but I am a drummer. Honestly, I was never able to really reach my goals with drumming. Didn't practice enough, you know, got busy, went to college, all that kind of stuff. Um, so when it came time to really write Lana performing music, I kind of struggled with that. You know, part of her inspiration is, you know, later in my life, I, I realized, well, I feel like I've always liked other music, but you do kind of identify with one certain genre or whatever, most of us. And you're like, I'm a metalhead, I'm a hardcore, you know, I'm this... And I really realized, you know what, maybe I've always kind of been an indie rock guy. And I started listening to amazing acts like St. Vincent and Angel Olsen and, and Wise Blood is another one that Dan introduced me to when we were making this book. And so when I, when I sit down to do that scene for her, you know, I try to think of these amazing uh, women uh, in music. And that, that was a little bit of a challenge, but thankfully... I have Dan to really say, you know, I can give him a short description and, and say, you know, here's where she's seen from. This is maybe the song that inspires it. And, and thankfully he nails it with that. So th th those are kind of hard for me. And writing lyrics is hard for me too. I mean, I'm, I know there is amazing drummers who've written lyrics, Phil Collins, Bill Ward and Black Sabbath. But I, you know, I don't know. I feel like I'm a little clunky with that. <laughs> You're not the only one that said that. Some some people have issues writing poems or songs or anything like that in comics. So you're actually the second person I've interviewed that has said that. So that's interesting. You're looking at this as a long-term project, nine some odd issues, 12 issues, however long you're going to go with this. But in this particular issue then, what did you edit out of the book? I'm going back and forth with Dan. Again, our, our initial plan was do four or five pages, see if we can get it picked up. We have an idea for, you know, roughly three arcs, see how it goes. You know, it's independent comics. I've been doing it long enough to where I understand you can't pitch your 75 issue magnum opus. Uh, it's probably not going to get picked up. You're probably not going to see it to fruition. Let's just be realistic. Uh, I'm not discouraging anyone from, from following their dreams, but it just honestly, that's typically how it works with most of my peers. You know, I had that in mind. So when I kind of got the idea that now was not really the time for, for publishers to be biting on this, maybe we need a little story. You know, I restructured it, you know, with Dan's input and said, let's, let's make like an intro story that itself is, is satisfying. A woman in a heavy metal world with an interesting story. She battles some nefarious characters and then we'll see where we're at. So it's actually within the Kickstarter, people will see there is a stretch goal to actually make the story bigger. And I think taking those scenes out of the original story, not having them have to be there, but if we get there, then there's a bigger story. So, and I'm trying to be realistic. I try to, you know, even I, I mentioned our, our first story last year, Child Possession Services, trying to give people a decent story with seeds that could be, that are planted, that could grow into a bigger story, but understanding again, it may be six months, a year or, or never till you get back to them. So try to give people, you know, a whole story. And again, that wasn't easy. You know, we can get frustrated when our plans or goals don't, go ABC. But this really gave me time to adjust the story, rewrite some scenes, you know, get to know the characters better. And I, I do feel like we have a stronger first issue for it, even if the series goes on, but somebody doesn't return. I still feel like I'm going to try to the best I can. Big inspiration for me is Mike Mignola's Hellboy. And he does that a lot. He writes the stories. Yes, there's a lot of five issue stories, but then there's a one shot. There's a two issue story. He does a really good job giving you a satisfying story that has a bigger world in it. It doesn't have to be all read at once. You could enjoy 
snippets of the Hellboy universe, uh, a majority of it. In terms of Kickstarters, is this your, this obviously isn't your first Kickstarter, is it? I think I want to say I'm on 11 at this point. I'm so old. I did something that was called Chip In about 12 years ago, mm-hmm. uh, which was, <laughs> all right, you can relate. So I've done a couple different crowdfunding things over the years. I think I'm 11 for 13 or something like that. So we've had some good success. In terms of this particular Kickstarter, then what have you learned from past Kickstarters that have helped you prepare for this Kickstarter? That's I've definitely learned over the years, but, you know, I think initially with Kingbone Press, you know, I mentioned that amazing message board community we had through 11 o'clock comics. I made a ton of contacts, friends, you know, I still have to this day. It was just a different environment back then with social media and promotion. Now, as the years have gone on, especially with social media, you have to really be on top of that if you want to be successful or you have to be very reasonable or modest with your goals. Even some of the most successful creators I've seen that have been doing this for 10 years, you know, are struggling to meet their goals or, or just barely making it or not at all. We actually had one that failed last year as well. After two very successful ones early in the year, you know, understanding a lot more aspects about how we get the information in front of people's eyes these days is really important to launching a Kickstarter. You have to have a, a decent mailing list. You have to have a social media presence. You have to be on all social media. I feel unless, you know, you're just a creator that's just very successful and already has a built-in audience that will, you know, pass it around, so to speak. We've even gone back to, you know, at conventions, handing out QR codes. Um, I'll be doing that for this one. You know, heck, I may even go back to a paper mailing list if it comes down to that. We've kind of come full circle to where social media is just really locked down. And if you want to get your project in front of people, you have to go through their avenues, pay for advertising. They will suppress your links. Otherwise, doing things like this, meeting awesome uh, interviewers and, and people who help indie comics like yourself, you got to put your time in in those areas as well if you want to get the word out. It's always fun seeing new new comics that I'm never aware of. And that's, you know, social media has been my only real way to get creative people like yourself on the show and to see different genres that I haven't even thought of or even read in my many years of doing this. I love indie creators and pros and people that are just starting out and those that are have established themselves but are trying something different. It keeps things exciting every every interview. So I love Yeah, that. and I don't recall who it was probably Chuck. You've been doing this so long. I've been doing this so long. We I, I your name looks familiar but I'm like I'm sure we've crossed paths in some sort of, you know, whatever. But it's, it's so funny. Yeah, good times. I mean, I, I was in Chicago at C2E2 uh, with the very first convention and the next four conventions after that. Sh- huh. Toronto is technically my uh, my home convention, but I'm like four hours away. <laughs> so it is what it is. I, I do what I can and, and I love it. It's just great. Yeah, C2E2 is a great show. But yeah, it is so interesting. Again, I missed the days of social media and it was all in order and you would see everyone's posts. And now it's like, you got to fight through that. So again, That's just a testament to to the fact that I I feel like I'm pretty heavily involved in indie comics. And yet I'm like, oh, wow, there's all these new shows and people that I get to meet like this. So, you know, but it is a big world. I mean, 7 billion people, you know, plus (laughs) doing this stuff, you know, one voice out of 7 billion, you know, your odds are easier to getting struck by lightning and winning the lottery than it is to, uh, to promote yourself. It feels like some days, but as a creative person that you are, you know, do you believe in creator block? Oh, for sure. I think that's something that it's a benefit of being your own publisher. You can go at your own pace. Again, I've, I've been working on this story for years. I have another story. Uh, Child Possession Services was after Trump Six of Doom. So mm-hmm. being able to sit on the story until I felt like it was ready for, it was probably a benefit. I, uh, at least I hope so for the story. Now, it, it doesn't make you always feel good about your production or that you're putting enough out. I think if you kind of diversify and have different projects, do different things, like if I'm having a horrible writing week, I can focus on my lettering or reach out to people, hey, you need help with lettering, do some flatting or do credits pages and stuff like that, promote the Kickstarter, get that ready. So I think that helps, but I do think creativity block, it is is a real thing. What's your creative kryptonite then? My creative kryptonite, what gets in? (laughs) Taking on too much probably. Well, when I started the company, the joke in the inside joke in the name is that I I don't want people to feel like I'm putting out inferior products, but I did want to kind of be honest that I work with a lot of creators and I myself, this is not my full-time gig what I'm saying. Uh, so part-time comics is kind of a tongue and weak cheek way of saying, you know, I love the creation, but I'm not going to be putting out five monthly books, you know, ever probably like in my whole life, Th- this will kind of be, you know, what I do. But then I set out, okay, I'm going to do three books the first year and it ended up, you know, more. And then now this year I said, I'm only going to focus on my titles. And I ended up doing two anthology series that are coming out. We have five books coming out this year. So I've already kind of 
overcommitted. That makes it hard because then I'm supposed to be sitting down and writing you know, the next issue of this or the next, you know, part of this. And I'm like, oh gosh, I have to set up, I have to set up another Kickstarter for after this one in May. So I have time to promote it. So overcommitment is, is definitely uh, always been my issue. What is the most underrated band that people should know about, but don't? The hands down, the most underrated band that people should know about is a band from the Chicagoland area called Tub Ring. I find them very inspirational in my writing. Uh, They're very much of the early 90s era they're like mr bungle faith no more ish primus ish just very energetic chaotic you know clean vocals but unpredictable and kind of of that era so if you have not listened to them they are one of my all-time favorites tub ring they had some you know national tours and things like that but they really never really blew up like like i would have uh, thought they would have because they were such a cool band from that era well then what's the most overrated band kiss <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll agree with that. maybe the doors i'm not a huge fan of the doors of jim morrison they got some good jams but i, I feel like kiss is, is more the theatrics I'm, I'm into heavy metal and that stuff so i know that 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 can be part of it is uh giving people a show but I, i've always felt like kiss was a little bit bigger than they should have been <laughs> i think for me it was it was two two bands in particular probably because they were just overplayed and i'm just sick of them in general pearl jam hootie and the blowfish yeah that's fair <laughs> I mean, Pearl Jam has a has a lot of talent, but yeah, no, of, no, of that good. of that era, I probably think there's definitely many that outshine them. Getting a little more introspective. Before I do that, though, is there anything that I haven't touched upon? And, and we'll get to your social media and, and the Kickstarter at the end of the interview that uh, you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview. Well, you know, we've touched on a lot of our projects. You know, we had another one that has struggled to reach print, and that happens. That's a book called Depowered by co-creator Bob Garonellis and I kind of our, our take on superheroes after they're not superheroes. Uh, so that's a project I'm, I'm really proud of. I think Kurt for putting a, my link tree is right here in the bottom. All of our projects can be found, you know, we're, we're housed on store envy right now, but that's a book that I think a lot of people missed. Uh, I think it was kind of a, a hectic end of the year and holidays and COVID and all that stuff. That was a project that it's still out. I've just ordered the books. I want it to get out into the world, but it really did not have the response I was hoping. And uh, that's one that, you know, I try to, try to drop in there so it looked interesting i i got a i, I took a quick glance at it I, I thought it was i think it's a great concept personally it's one similar to that not necessarily because they're depowered if you've ever seen the comic super fogies oh i have not <laughs> hilarious by the way it's about superheroes that go to an elderly home called valhalla they still have their powers and there's a bunch of things with it it's really well done it's um Check it out. The Super Fogies is what it's called. At what point are we good enough? Boy, I think that question is different for everybody. I think for creatives, uh, maybe never. We never feel like doing enough or adequate enough or as good as other people. But I think as human beings in general. But uh, maybe again, it's my put my social work hat on. You are good enough from start. If you're not doing harmful things to other people and you're trying to be a positive force in this world, you're, you're good enough from the start. So then what in life is beautiful to you? You know, beautiful is, is human interaction. You know, I think a lot of times people grumble on the internet. Uh, you know, I wish I lived in a mountain somewhere and I never had to, you know, deal with. I enjoy, you know, I'm not that old, but I feel like I'm old in comics creation wise. I'm probably not going to reach that goal to write Amazing Spider Man in my lifetime. I'm probably not going to be published by too many major publishers, but, you know, you have to enjoy this aspect, you know, talking to people, meeting new people, going to conventions and having people uh, be excited about seeing your book, have people email you about them, send you messages. I think there's a lot of value in human interaction. I think sometimes we get frustrated because the challenges that come with humanity, you know, we are a beautiful species and we can do great things. What's one mistake that you'll never do again? I hope a mistake I'll never do again is I did a very large anthology. Uh, Someone's very excited, even flew out to the previously mentioned C2E2 to to get it. And it was not in the book. I had other people look at it, but again, it was 240 something pages. I had his name in the credits and everything. And just, you know, I I hope that I never do that again, Uh, either by not taking on a project that big or, you know, by giving myself more time before I I send that off to print. So that that was a bummer in my career. What is the second wisest thing someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? That's an interesting way to put it. I can think of the wisest, but I'm not sure I want to move it down to second wisest. I think as far as comics, hire an editor, maybe. (laughs) <laughs> have somebody look over your stuff. I, it's definitely something I've, uh, I've tried to do. I have a lot of close friends in the community that are very helpful. They do amazing things. You know, they're not always going to tell you, you know, an editor might, or they might not even catch it. You know what? They're reading it. And they're like, this is great. I love this. 
and you know they missed that there was no word balloon in this spot or you spelled something wrong you know you, you got to get a professional in there to clean it up everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today who was that for you well uh, funny the question you asked earlier about uh advice that I've given the first person that came to mind and it wasn't in comics, but it was in life in general. I, I feel like my grandmother is a huge inspiration for me. I mean, particularly the comics, she's the first one that took me to a comic shop. So that's a huge part of it. Um, but you know, she, her words of advice to me were always those who have should help those who have not. Um, and I, I've always tried to carry that with me again you know, there's a lot of narcissism in what we do as, as creators. Let's be honest. You know, we want people to read our stories and, and give us feedback. And, and I don't know, it maybe even earn a little money and live a little easier. I'm not, I'm not so altruistic that I can't admit that. Um, but again, if you're working with your friends or you're promoting other people or you're sharing in the joy of, you know, creation of comics, um, that part of it, um, you know, you're seeing someone who's struggling, you're helping them with lessons that you've learned. Uh, trying to do good, you know, maybe, you, again, you are doing this for your own personal reasons, but there isn't any reason that you can't also do good for others, lift others up, be a positive voice. Um, you know, those times where you really want to, I don't know, blast someone on the internet, and I'm guilty of it too. Kind of hear my, kind of hear my grandma's voice in the back of my head and saying, you know what, um, you know what, I'm in a, I'm in a privileged position. I have a decent job. I'm able to do this a as a fun hobby. Let's not uh, let's not be negative. Let's uh, find somebody that, uh, you know, we can help today. And, and I, I feel like I've done that. I've published a ton of anthologies and other things, um, you know, trying to help people get their work out there and trying to do the part that can be a challenge for a lot of people, which is, you know, seeing a project through to fruition it is is a challenge. Uh, and I enjoy that part of it. I enjoy, you know, people seeing me as, as somebody who can get projects done. So, uh, you know, that's that's somebody who's very much inspires me every day. From a professional perspective, you have been successful on 11 of 13 Kickstarter campaigns. You have created comics. You have started lettering. You have done artwork. You are basically an all-around professional when it comes to comics. And, you know, you're taking a great story and you're making it into a comic that I'm sure everyone will enjoy. So professionally, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Um, I do. I, I think Five years ago, again, as I was struggling to what I wanted to do with uh, Kingbone Press and where I wanted to be as a creator, I, I think that answer might have been different a few years ago. But, you know, I've had some introspection. And, you know, even though, again, I, um, I am a, a, a licensed clinical social worker by trade, uh, you know, you're not always able to uh, do what you say. You know what I mean? Um, so there's been some times where I've not been satisfied. but I think, I think being able to have that background and, and, and work with other people and just um, be in that field has really helped me say, you know what, enjoy your successes, however small they may be. Um, and if you set your goals too hyper-specific or too, I don't want to say large, because you know, people should have big goals. I, I think if you're too focused on, you know, I want to... Uh, you know, be on the radio. I want to make a song and be on the radio. Uh, that may not happen. You know, not too many people reach that goal. But if you say, I want to make music and you get a job hired where you play every Fridays at your local bar, I mean, you are still making music. So for me, it was like, why am I stressing about not making, you know, $10,000 every book and not uh, having 3,000 copies out there and, and, and being in Diamond? Why, why am I not focused on, I've made dozens of books, dozens of characters, you know, I had a 15 or 16 issue series with a, a close friend of mine. I've, I've had all these awesome successes. Uh, and, and, and I've, I've understood that, 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 that is, that is enough. So I would consider myself successful yet. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, I had a recent, a couple of recent failures actually last year, trying to launch a book and, I'd like to say that I handled it with, you know, all the grace and humility that, you know, anybody would, but I, you know, I've, I've struggled. There's still times where you say, you know what, is this worth it? I want to quit. You know, I could be spending time with my family, uh, but here I am, you know, uh, trying to figure out how to get these funny books out into the world. Um, so, I, you know, I've always felt like I'm a person who 
doesn't necessarily overreact right away. I, people in, 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 you know, my coworkers, you know, call me very patient. So I try to utilize that and just say, this is a moment you will get through this moment. If you haven't made a decision, that's really going to hurt yourself or, or bankrupt your family or something, you can always recover. Um, so I, I think I've gotten better, but I, I could still improve. I definitely need to um, reach out to my support system more often, let them know when I'm stressed. Uh, you know, that really helps, you know, encouraging, you know, talking to other people who've struggled uh, and how they've worked through it. Um, I feel like I'm still learning, even at you know, 40 plus years old, I still need to handle failure a little bit better. The young generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And in fact, you do have the younger generation with you and they're hopefully becoming inspired to be whatever they would like to be in their lifetime. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Well, that, that's a challenging question. Of course, you know, I don't know if I necessarily sit down with the intent to inspire other people, um, but you may even hear some of the people I want to inspire running around behind me as they get a little restless <laughs> while dad's mm -hmm. distracted. But yeah, I hope that they, they are inspired by seeing someone reach their goals, seeing someone enjoy it. Um, even, you know, younger people, not all of our books are for younger people, but people who come across these things. Again, comics especially is a medium that people can tell their stories. I mean, I've created, I've seen people create as little as, you know, drawings on Xerox paper and go to the, you know, Kinko's and, and copy them out. That's still a comic. And I, that's what I enjoy about comic books. So that is something I try to teach my niece and my kids. You know, if you want to create something, even if it's just for yourself or each other, just to read, you can do it. And that creates, you know, joy. Um, so hopefully that's the way I can uh, inspire the younger generation to say, you know what, it doesn't matter what your job is, so to speak. Uh, you can still do creative things that you enjoy, create music, um, comics, all that stuff. Uh, just do it for yourself. Well, John, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You've survived, so I appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm sweating over here. <laughs> <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you? And of course, where can we find the Kickstarter and, and help you get this uh, become, you know, 12 of 14 success? So again, I appreciate you taking the time and, and all the thoughtful questions, you know, again, finding you recently and hearing some of the other interviews uh, still doesn't prepare you for the, uh, <laughs> the grilling professionalism that you have. So I do appreciate it. Thanks again for putting the Linktree. That's the best way to find us, linktree.com forward slash part-time comics. We're, we're on social media at part-time comics with an X, um, but like Instagram, it's part underscore time underscore comics. So it can be a little confusing, but if you even just Google part-time comics with an X. Most of us come up, but the link tree is the best. We always put our, our most recent um, pre-order books and Kickstarters on there. Otherwise, you can go to Kickstarter and search the word Strum Sticks of Doom. Thankfully, there isn't another project with the same name on there or close. Um, but yes, that, that's uh, the best way to find us. And I, I am on uh, Twitter as an, at anti underscore drummer. Uh, so if you really want to hear me spout off, you know, if you don't I uh, want the, uh, the saturated version of my professional account. You can go there and hear me mostly talk about Magic the Gathering, to be honest. <laughs> well, quick overrated, underrated. You don't have to think too hard on it. Uh, Magic the Gathering edition. Uh, colors, specifically colors. Overrated, underrated, red. Red is underrated. Overrated, underrated, blue. Over. Despite my shirt color, the most overrated color. <laughs> Overrated, underrated, black. I will choose adequately rated. Black is, is my second favorite color. <laughs> uh, overrated, underrated, green. I think underrated. I still think a lot of people think of it as a casual color, big monsters, but especially in the last few years, green's gotten a lot, lot better. <laughs> and last one, overrated, underrated, white. I think white is adequately rated as well in that it is it has always been a color they've struggled to um, know what to do with and hopefully in the next couple of years it'll get a lot more balanced with some of the other colors and then favorites favorite magic the gathering set favorite magic the gathering set is probably odyssey that's about the first time that i started playing maybe torment that's came right after uh, i've been playing old man been playing for a while so th those are two of the most nostalgic at least for me
Uh, again, thank you for coming on the show. Greatly appreciate it. you can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com. That's the word, do not the number two, of course, tgtmedia.com and our YouTube channel, which is more updated than our website, unfortunately. I apologize, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that up. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.